All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, getting on our first set of breakout sessions today. I know people are still logging in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So we have time for our uh, group discussion, which is going to be fantastic. Um, I'm really excited for the session that we're jumping into, which is asking the right questions to find the right people. Um, all of us are dealing with how do we do that, right? We're, we have these positions open and we go through the hiring process. And, you know, how do you make sure you're getting the right person? It's, it's so difficult to, you know, make that decision after two or three meetings. You know, you'd never marry somebody you just met, right? So, <laughs> but you're kind of doing that when it comes to workforce. So um, I'm really excited to hear what our featured speaker today, uh, Kendall Drexler from Hospice of Shenango County is going to share with us. Um, just real quick, uh, Kendall serves as the executive director of Hospice and Palliative Care of Shenango County. She's been there for five years and is a licensed master of social work. Kendall is especially interested in building strong organizational communities. Um, and just a shout out, last year she was one of our featured speakers as well and talked about workplace culture and team building. And I know a number of people who attended that session who took some of her ideas and implemented them even to today. Um, and I know I did too. So I'm very happy to have her back once again to talk about this process of how do you, how do you find the right people? And that comes down to asking the right questions. So um, I know Kendall is fine with people participating, unmuting yourself, and she wants us to be interactive or feel free to use the chat. And between Kendall and myself, we'll, we'll monitor that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker, Kendall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so like Carrie said, I presented last year about a lot of uh, different things at hospice, and I decided this year to sort of drill down into how we interview people. So um, we use a process called behavioral interviewing at Hospice Shenango. So I wanted to say that right off the bat, if you're listening and you know everything about behavioral interviewing, please take over and do the presentation for me. Um, I mean, you can go to the other one if you'd prefer. I just, I want people to be clear about what it's about. Uh, and as Carrie said, ask questions. And um, I think we'll have a great discussion. So by the end of this session, I'm hoping that everyone will be able to define the term behavioral interviewing. You'll be able to describe how behavioral interviewing can be used to learn more about potential job applicants than you probably were learning before. And uh, you can, you should be able to understand how you could start to use this technique in your workplace. Um, I have a couple of disclaimers. Um, I've been the executive director at hospice for five years, but I've worked here for 12. So um, uh, I throw that out there. I'm not an HR person. We don't have an HR person. We are a really small, independent uh, healthcare not-for-profit, and we try to put all of our possible funds to our clinical team, our nurses and social workers, and, and the people that are actually caring for our patients. So um, I'm the HR specialist for uh, by default. And um, the other thing is, in light of what we do, we're Hospice of Shenango County. So at some points in this uh, conversation, I will be talking about uh, death and dying. And I apologize in advance if that makes you uncomfortable. That is the world that we operate in. This is a sort of distorted cartoon from the man, Randy Glassbergen. It says, my short-term goal is to bluff my way through this job interview. And my long-term goal is to invent a time machine so I can come back and change everything I've said so far. I think that people um, often have that experience when they interview. You know, I think we um, are all sort of trained to how to prepare for an interview in a rather old fashioned way. Um, when I was doing research for this, I found a statistic that the number of jobs requiring both analytical and social skills has increased by 94% since 1980. And that's especially true for the staff that we're looking for at hospice. Um, you know, they have to be really good with their analytical skills and their clinical area of expertise, but then they also have to have amazing social skills and be able to meet all different types of people where they're at in their own homes, right? So we're providing healthcare in a very unregulated environment because we bring it to your house. Um, so I'm not gonna throw this up to offend anybody. If these are your current interview questions, these were our interview questions at hospice. And when I Googled it, these are um, this is a Google search of like the most common interview questions. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your pet peeves? 
what won't you miss about your last job? Like when I read through this, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe people actually ask this. What's the worst thing you've gotten away with? Um, but these are what Google says are the most common questions that are asked or that people are preparing for when they're coming um, to do an interview. And, you know, I, I have to say that one of the things I hate about these questions the most, and, and I'm guessing that you've all experienced this, is, you know, the person that's like, well, my biggest weakness is also my strength. I just care so much. I work too hard. Don't know when to stop. I don't know when to say no. And um, in the old times here at hospice, you know, you'd kind of be like, ding, ding, red flag. But I'm not entirely sure what the red flag is, right? Like, we're looking for people who are really honest about their um, abilities and skills. Uh, Sometimes we are attracted to workaholics, but we sort of want to know like what people's motivation is for being a workaholic, right? Is it because you have a deep passion for serving people or is it because you get some type of personal fulfillment from that? Because that will most likely cause a problem in our team-based culture. Um, and then my, the bottom one, are you a starter or a finisher? That was a classic one that we asked here at hospice. Like that was always the last question that we asked, are you a starter or a finisher? And I, when I was a staff uh, member here, I always thought like, to what end? Like, what are we even hoping to um, get from that question? And I think one of the difficult things about this, these types of common interview questions is you're not really sure what you're hoping to get at the end you know, like you're not really sure what you're hoping the answer will be. You know it when you hear a really good answer, but it's sort of difficult to assess out the bad, the bad answers, right? So that brings us to behavioral interviewing. So this is a weird, um, this is weird. When the other thing, when I was Googling all those most asked interview questions, it said that behavioral interviewing is the preferred interviewing technique of 73 73% of HR professionals worldwide. None of those questions that I just showed you are behavioral interviewing questions. So I was like, how are these the most common? But then 73% of people are using the technique that we're about to talk about it. It's a little bit of a disconnect. Um, but behavioral interviewing is focusing on a candidate's past experience by asking candidates to provide specific examples of how they've demonstrated certain behaviors, knowledge, skills, or abilities. I'm sorry if I'm skipping words because uh, your faces are right in the middle of the slide. So when you're thinking about how do you start with behavioral interviewing or how do you go about setting up a new type of interviewing for your organization, um, you, I'm gonna sort of piggyback on what Hilda was saying. You know, You have to understand the values, ethics, behaviors, and knowledge of your organization. Like what are the things that all the great employees do really well? What are the, what are the um, abilities that people need to have to really make our organization tick at its fullest possible potential? So the question should be specific and they should probe for a key task or behavior. And one of the places that you might be able to get some really good um, starting framework for behavioral interview questions is to look at your job descriptions and sort of pick out the core competencies that you might have listed there and sort of start there, right? If you want somebody that's really detail oriented according to a job description, then you're gonna wanna think of a couple of behavioral interviewing questions that help to pull out what that looks like for them. So uh, I actually pulled this slide from last year for anybody uh, that attended. Um, so forgive me for recycling, but this is the needs assessment that we had sort of done at Hospice of Shenango County. And again, we did this over time. Like it took two to three years to um, sort of get it exactly how we wanted it. And it's always changing. Um, we always think of new questions based on things that have happened um, that we've witnessed, right, from employees that have either left or employees that we recognize have a special skill or ability that we really want to try to look for in others. And so this is what we came up with. Uh, the workers at hospice really need to be fiercely independent. Um, like I said before, we provide 
uh, specialized end of life healthcare to people living in their homes. So um, we have to make sure that people feel really comfortable. Like you never know what you're, what's behind that door. Scary dogs, scary people, um, scary bugs, uh, so many different things, right? So we really need people that are not just blowing smoke up our butt about how competent and confident they are. They really have to be competent and confident and independent. But going with that, they need to be humble and willing to take feedback, right? You know, we're not we're not in a position here at hospice where we, we all work in an office and we overhear things that people say that we want to correct or we witness it normally. We hear about a staff member sort of making a faux pas by getting a call from a family member. And, you know, the flip side of being fiercely independent is you got to be able to take feedback when you made a mistake or at least be able to have a conversation about why you did what you did and why you thought it was right. And obviously going hand in hand with that, you have to be ethical, right? You, we have to trust that when you are alone in the, these families' homes, that you are not going to be making them feel weird, that you are going to be respectful of their culture and their practices and the things that they want to keep doing. And a lot of times in hospice, that's things like smoking, even though they have are dying of lung cancer continuing to drink even though they are dying of, um, you know, end-stage renal disease or some other alcoholic type disease, right? Like, um, we really have to have an ability to sort of honor people genuinely who they are and where they are. Um, we want people who are hungry for learning and personal and professional growth. So we're the only hospice in Chenango County and we employ one social worker who is the only hospice social worker in this county. We don't have peers and we really need, um, because it's healthcare and because it's specialized and um, we wanna be dynamic, we need to make sure that we're looking for people who are really hungry and learning for themselves and that their careers are important to them and, and learning more is, um, you know, part of the mission. And again, these these uh, these concepts dovetail like healthcare professional ethics. So if there's an, a code of ethics for the certain type of industry that you have, that's another place that you could pull sort of the framework for what types of behavioral interviewing questions you're gonna ask. Um, we don't want martyrs or angels or lone wolves. People often tell us like, you're, you're an angel, you're a godsend. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, and we love to get that feedback who doesn't, but we are not hiring people who are like explicitly looking for that type of feedback, right? We, um, the people that sort of need that filled within themselves, it's gonna create problems again in our culture. Um, and our values that are printed on our wall and that we state freely are collaboration, integrity, competence, and commitment. And then we also really firmly believe here that we're all teachers first. We are, allowing family members to care for their dying loved one at home. And that is a gift that they are giving to their loved one, not a gift that we're giving to them. We're teaching them how to do it, but we're not doing it for them. So that is our framework, super simple and black and white. So this is the best um, model to help you start wrapping your head around behavioral interviewing questions. And it's called the STAR model. So the S stands for situation. You have to think about the situ, you have to ask about the situation the candidate was in. And you do that by saying something like, tell me about a time. And then you ask what the candidate needed to accomplish. So where you were faced with multiple conflicting deadlines. Then you wanna figure out what action they took. So what did you do? And the R stands for results. So what were the results of the action? So the full question is, tell me about a time where you were faced with multiple conflicting deadlines. What did you do and how did it turn out? And you know, everyone that sits on an interview panel at hospice knows that we're looking for people who are, again, pretty independent and competent, know when they need to ask for help, demonstrate through this example that they ask for help. Maybe they asked for the deadline to be extended. Maybe they asked, pulled in another team member to help them get it done. Um, we're always sort of trying to assess like, what are they saying about their stress level? Where do they put uh, the blame for things that go wrong? Is it, you know, can they indicate that they've sort of owned something, a mistake, um, something that needed to be fixed? Or is it always, um, you know, passing, passing the blame? 
there's a question. I'm gonna look at it quick. Oh yeah, thank you, Hillary. Yeah, that is a very universal question. And I'm hoping that some of the ones I'm about to show you are gonna be um, universal. But I'm having, there we go. So here's some of our um, questions. And I, and I tried to just show you like what umbrella we felt they fell, fell under. So we, and we do three interview, interviews at hospice, no matter what, um, you know, through the pandemic. I hope none of you, I can't see you all. So I hope that none of you have recently applied for our jobs. Um, you know, we're healthcare and we have had an open RN position since the beginning of the um, pandemic. So we make a joke that we've like interviewed every RN in the county every RN in the five county radius. Um, we do it every time we do it this way, even if there's only one candidate, because we've learned that when we don't do it this way, we um, almost instantly sort of feel the repercussions of what, um, of what, of not answering all the questions. So what it looks like is uh, you send your resume into Indeed for an open job. Somebody from um, middle management calls you and asks you five relatively open-ended questions that I'll show you in a bit. We set up one interview, uh, depending on people's preference and where, they're, where they are, either Zoom or in person. We um, typically do that first interview with only the management team. There's four of us. Um, and then if we like the candidate, we bring them back in for another round of interviews where there is one person from management who is most likely gonna be their immediate supervisor if they got the job and the other people are either their peers or key people that they would work with for support. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go back for one second. I'm sorry, I haven't been looking at my notes as, as closely as I should have. One of the things I wanted to say is in doing research for um, this presentation, I found that it was just, it was basically like a, a website of um, labor statistics that were just kind of collated, right? I cannot say for certain, like, don't, it's not the best data that's out there, right? It was just the most available data on Google. But it said that when you're looking for new employees, referrals are five times more likely to get you a hire. And I was thinking about that for the past week since I've been preparing for this um, uh presentation. And we don't have a formalized referral process at hospice, but because we did all that work together and sort of sussing out the people that the types of people that we want to work here, every RN that is currently employed by us was recruited by another RN. So that works here. So um, Nydia, who is our most senior RN recruited Jenny because she worked with her at Chase, which is a, a skilled nursing facility that we have a contract with. She recognized in Jenny that Jenny has all the qualities that make a really good hospice worker and told her that she should apply. And Jenny applied. She actually started um, the day of the day the world shut down, March, uh, what, 13th, 2020. And uh, a year ago, Jenny brought, recruited to us uh, Natalie from, from Public Health. And there's been some other people in that mix, some other RNs, but the people that have really um, stayed and fit in well with the culture have um, been recruited by the nurses here. And we don't incentivize them for that. And if anybody listened last year, we incentivized for a lot of things. So I'm probably going to have to wrap my head around what that might look like because um, the staff have done a really good job of helping us find the people that we need to do a really good job. So anyway, when we're looking for empathy, we ask the question, can you tell me about the last time you put yourself in someone else's shoes and how that made you feel? For coachability, we're asking, can you tell me about a time your supervisor was effective in redirecting your performance? Um, we had a person one time that said, no, I can't, but I can tell you all about the last terrible supervisor I had. I was like, interview's over. Um, ethical, uh, describe a time when you were asked to perform a task or spearhead an initiative that went against your values and what did you do and what was the outcome? Um, let's see, I'm gonna mention that in a minute. Teaching, right? So I said that teaching is really important to us and we ask the following questions. Describe a time you gave someone instructions and then learned that he or she did it wrong and why do you think that happened? And we know that we're looking for people who are like, I said it too fast. I gave the instructions too quickly. 
I didn't ask for a read back. I didn't, you know, people who recognize that communication is a two way street and that a lot of times if you're giving instructions and someone did it wrong, it was most likely the fault of the instructor and not the instructee. Uh, can you describe how teaching patients and families about end of life signs and symptoms empowers them? So we're looking for the people that understand that teaching people about what is going to come ahead it relieves their anxiety, it relieves their uh, tension in the family, it makes them feel empowered to be able to take control of the situation that they are currently in. And then we always have uh, everybody that works for us, regardless of your position, um, teach us something new in the next three minutes. And we actually have like a stand timer and we flip it because it's super dramatic and makes it feel like there's more pressure than there really is. And again, I can't see everybody, but I think Elias here. She's our newest um, employee at hospice. She's our new admin assistant. And uh, three weeks ago, she <laughs> she taught us how to make pizza. So um, now we all know that. And um, but the point there is for the teaching us things. We ask people teach us something like you're a brand like we're brand new humans and we know nothing. So people are not teaching us about you know um, like PTSD or how to give morphine or some highly clinical thing. They're teaching us how to tie our shoes, how to brush our teeth. People have taught us songs. People, you know, we're just basically looking for, are you comfortable teaching? Uh, do you get the basic fundamentals of teaching somebody else how to do things, that kind of thing. Uh, last year, I mentioned that we like to ask questions that throw people off and we normally wait and we ask them at the very end. And these are some of my favorites. So we sometimes ask how many pennies would fit in this room? We have no idea how many pennies would fit in the room. But what we want to watch, what we're watching for is like your facial expression. What do you, you know, what do you look like when you're totally caught off guard? Because we just asked you 12 questions in a row about death and dying and, you know, uh, being attentive and empowering others. And now we're asking how many pennies would fit in the room totally out of the blue. Um, and, and we want to see your thought process. Like some people are like, they try to start out, like do a math problem. You know, if you laid them down this way and then laid them down this way and then times it, some people are like, you know, is there a prize at the end if I get it right, which then you understand how they're motivated to, um, you know, do their work. Um, all different answers, but then we always tell people that we don't know the right answer and they're a little disappointed. Um, can you name three consecutive days without using the words Wednesday, Friday, or Saturday? The correct answer could be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, but it could also be today, tomorrow, yesterday. It could be, um, there's one other one. And, and again, we're just trying to see like, um, interviews are scary already. We know that. We know that people are nervous and they might not be presenting as their best self. But we, um, again, we're just watching. We're just watching you like creepers to see what your face looks like while you're thinking that through, and and if you're willing to sort of tell us about your thought process. Um, and then, can you think of a time that you had to make a split second decision, and what was your thinking process? So. Um, a lot of the times our staff are in positions where they have to make split second decisions without a manager's approval. Sometimes we ask a question like, um, can you describe the last time that you made a decision without a manager's approval and what was the outcome? A lot of times things like that happen because we always seem to have a patient at, at the, the farthest reaches of the county where there's no cell service, right? So all of the tools that our staff normally have to get the information that they need, they no longer have, and they're gonna have to make a decision and come back to the office and tell someone, you know, why they did what they did and be open to feedback about how they could do it differently next time. Uh, and then okay. just, yeah. There is a question in here about what the, oh, sorry. Um, that's okay, I just don't wanna get too far before. Um, uh, they, uh, it's from uh, Brianna and she's asking, about interviews that she's been through and she found that a lot of people usually stick to the questions you first pointed out about the strengths, weaknesses and upper open-ended questions are in the first interview. And then the second one tends to be more behavioral. Do you think that's a good model or do you feel like both stages of the interview should be based on behavioral questions? I, I guess my answer to that question is how valuable is your time? You know, I think that we've, I think, my time here is very valuable because I'm the CEO, IT, HR, uh, you know, all the fixer of the things. And um, 
I want, I only want to bring in people for a second interview, especially if I'm asking field staff to take their time to interview people that are really worth interviewing. So my worry would be that we would, we would do it that way. And then we would sort of find out that we shouldn't, that we wasted other people's times, uh, people that's, uh, you know, um, staff who I, whose time I feel like is more valuable than mine, you know, the RNs and the social workers and the LPNs that work here that are really making a difference for our patients and really like immediately solving a problem. They, their time cannot be wasted by, you know, dumb bureaucratic stuff that their boss makes them do. Do you know, does that sort of answer the question? But we do, I'm going to show you just in a minute, we do start both interviews out with open-ended questions that are not behavioral to sort of help them ease into it. So some other questions are, describe a situation where you and a colleague whom you relied on for support were in conflict and how did you address it? How would you measure your adaptability? Can you give an example of a time that you had to change one of your processes after doing it the same time, after doing it the same way for a very long time. Um, in hospice world, our God is uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare Services, and they do not care how hard it is to make the changes that they regulate. They regulate them. You find out about it on October 1, and by January 1, you need to have put the regulation or the new thing in place. Um, so, you know, we're really looking for people that understand that that's sort of like the nature of our work and that the change is part of it and it happens all the time. Can you tell us about a time where you felt defeated, where your project, um, where you were unable to meet your boss's timeline goals? Your idea was, um, I can't see the end, your idea was, I think it's dismissed. Um, and how did you respond to the adversity? Uh, again, you know, we're looking for people who are like, um, yeah, you know, I, I throw out ideas all the time and Sometimes they get slapped down and sometimes they're accepted. Uh, we're always looking for people who want to, who find joy in bouncing ideas off of others to get to an even better idea than you would have thought of on your own. Um, I've been keeping this quote on my bulletin board so that I can look at it every morning. And it, cause sometimes I'm a type A control freak and it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And um, I just think that's, really powerful and we try to embrace that every day here. Um, so that was a sidebar. So here's some tips for conducting behavioral interviews. Ease into the questions, like I said, answering Brianna's question by asking open-ended general questions. So um, tell us about yourself, right? People are normally like, what do you wanna know? And we're like, well, what do you want us to know? Um, and it goes from there. What are your best developed clinical or administrative skills? So that's different than, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? It's, it's sort of harder to um, uh, flake out on. And you also have to demonstrate that you know what an administrative or clinical skill is that would be worthy of having and doing well. What do you know about our hospice? Um, that is a question that you have to ask because um, I don't know about you guys, but it's very frustrating to employ people who have not researched your company at all before they come interview for you. And in 2022, uh, we still get a ton of people that are like, I know nothing about your organization. And I'm like, you did not Google how to prepare for an old school interview. Um, you have to be able to allow them to skip questions if they can't think of an answer. There are some people that we've interviewed that are so off put by this type of interviewing that they're like, they can't answer any of the questions. And, and you can tell that it's like um, causing them to stress that, the, that this is not what they prepared for and they don't have answers ready to give. Um, but you should always go back to the questions and ask them again. And um, once they've gotten a hold of the format, because a lot of times people do sort of understand what you're looking for. And then um, I just always think it's important to give people a second chance to go back and see if they thought about it more or now that they've answered some of the other questions, do they understand sort of what we're looking for? And I think this is the last slide and then we can do questions and have a discussion. And again, another Randy, uh, my previous employer was Acme Cardboard Container Company and I was fired for thinking outside of the box. It's just little office humor. I'm gonna stop sharing. Nope, new share, stop share. 
And fantastic. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yes. I am. Um, so I 100% interviewed people incorrectly. Um, so <laughs> um, thank you for Brianna for calling me out. Um, <laughs> oh, oh my God, I didn't even put that together. Subtle Brianna, very subtle. She's very good. She's very good. <laughs> but I, you know, I think we get stuck in these like, I mean, you know, again, I, and I like the, you know, we have a, a, a group of people here, um, you know, like you, Kendall, I, I don't have HR, right? So by default, I'm the HR person and I have people on my board I can ask and I have people who are in HR I can ask, but it's so different than when you're managing it yourself and when you have a small team, you know, how do you do it? And so for me, you know, I guess I do ask those questions during the first interview because the first one's with me. And so sort of that's sort of my clearinghouse. Do you meet the basic qualifications for the job? What, let me tell me a little bit about you. And then when I bring them in, they meet with the whole team. And that's when I do more of those behavioral questions. But, um, and I think partly for me, I do that because I don't want them to come in having done questions I've already asked them. So they have like a rehearsed feeling about it. But I, I like the idea of changing it around a little bit. How do I institute some of those behavioral questions so I can weed out those people first off before I take up my team's time. So that's, I, I, I love everything you said. I wrote a lot of notes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the website is such a big red, like it's like, I, I don't want to be super rude or offensive, but in my crazy head, I'm like, are you an adult? Like, are you an adult that really wants to be employed? Like, it, it's like two clicks, you know, just like, read it and think of one fact. Like, I don't know. Kim, did you have a question? Um, uh, just a comment. Thank you. I love everything you said. And I actually, um, my pseudo HR person is on this as well. And I texted her and said, are you writing this down? Because we are currently interviewing for a drug-free communities coordinator and um, great questions. Thank you. I am writing everything down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Kendall, can you I wanted, talk a little I, bit? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh, say, unless oh, somebody else has a question, feel free to jump in. Can you talk a little bit more about, because I really love that concept of the brainstorming. What does the team need? What do you need? Um, what does that look like? I know you said it took a couple of years to come up with those, like what you're looking for in candidates, but was it sort of a casual, like it was an organic conversation that developed over time from people in and out of the position? Or did you actually have like a meeting with your team to talk about, okay, we have this position, what are we looking for? A little of both. So um, we actually learned about this concept. So uh, there is a national hospice organization, it's called NHPCO, and they put on a huge leadership conference every spring. And a couple years ago, um, I went, to, they had, so it's a couple different conferences kind of smashed together and you can go on the weekend and get like management development as it relates to the hospice world, which is very specialized and, um, you know, in New York state, there's only 43 hospice CEOs, there's 43 hospices. Again, it's, you know, it's a sort of an isolating um, job. And um, we learned about it there. So I learned about it there. And then Sarah Green, who is one of our other staffs, was at a different like compliance training. And when we got done, and this is oftentimes how change happens at our hospice, um, because maybe it's because I love learning. So like, I try to never go to a conference alone. I try to always drag someone with me. And then I try to make them talk about all the concepts ad nauseum on the drive home. So like this conference was in DC. So, you know, the six hour drive home, I'm like, Sarah, let's think of these behavioral interview questions, you know? And then the next year we sent two other staff to that um, behavioral management. So they learned sort of the concept. And when they came back, they were like, we, I would say that we were like halfway there. So I'm going to retract my answer from before and say that, you know, like if you need to ease into it as an organization, ease into it, right? Ask half um, open-ended and half behavioral. So we sent two other staff that sort of rounded out our management team and they learned the concepts and um, being able to bounce it off of other hospice professionals. And then when they came back the next year, it was really when we sort of like honed all of the um, questions the vision and the values and um, sort of the things that keep us together was done as part of a strategic planning process for our organization that our board spearheaded in um, 2018. Um, and it was also wrapped up like in a, in a rebrand. And um, again, we had all been at a conference at the New York state level where um, we actually together wrote our new mission statement during lunch circling back to the alco uh, alcoholics Freudian slip 
workaholics. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else feel free to jump in and ask questions. I'll say I changed my interview questions from your presentation last year and it I think it helped a lot. Did it good I'm glad I've I, you know that's what I was going to say before I interrupted Carrie is I'm trying to think of like. I, I feel like I should have given you some more examples of how it really like changed our culture and. You know, I, I guess all I can say is that I feel like when we actually choose a candidate, we have a better idea of like what they might need to work on. Um, somebody that is no longer employed here, I, I thought this was fascinating and we didn't put it together until the end, right? But somebody who no longer works here, we were getting a couple of calls, like complaints from patients and families about her, about, um, you know, it was sort of like her style and presentation, like she was short and abrupt and they expected hospice workers to be um, kind and gentle and full of endless patience. And um, when the when her manager came to tell me about like that the complaints were stacking up, she was like, and I was just, I just pulled up her interview and she couldn't answer the empathy question. She could not think of a time she put herself in someone else's shoes. And this is how it's now playing out for us. Right. And I and and that's like the only very tangible example I can give you. But, I, you know, um, that's sort of a way that we've kind of honed what we're looking for. And I think that was like that happened to us and we kind of got bit by it. But now we know, like, maybe that is a really important question. And if we can't find people that can answer it to our liking, we're going to be bit later on down the road, you know, and and like the reputation of the organization. Right. I think we all understand that, like, um, our employees are the faces of the organization that we're running and um, we want them to be respected and respectful. Bree's trying to suck up in the chat. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, I was totally messing. Um, actually, you know, we, so I would say we've started to add some of those, quite, you know, I liked it when you said before, I was kind of laughing when you said part of it is watching your face, right? Uh, watching how you answer it. Um, you know, so because I have a couple of my recent people here, they'll know, I won't call anybody out specifically, but, um, you know, so we ask a couple of questions. We sort of consider them our fun questions. And so we'll ask them, if you were a tree, what kind would you be and why? Partly it's to see how they answer it. And I think it, tells a little bit about their personality and how they describe themselves. And you get questions sort of, you get answers across the board. And, you know, sometimes they're really like um, specific answers, like, well, a red oak, because it's tall, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, okay, well, that's not fun. But um, actually, I am going to call out, I think Jenna is on, I think she had said she was a crab apple tree, but her answer was amazing. Jenna, are you want to comment? Yeah, on <laughs> I'm on. <laughs> um, tell them, tell them your answer why. Um, so mine was a crab apple tree because they are the weirdest tree that I've ever experienced. They are underappreciated, but they still have great qualities. So they're kind of hidden behind the scenes, but they still produce fruit. They are extremely sturdy. I mean, they weather, I don't know how many storms, but they also have their own quirks, which is me. Um, who have a little crabby side, so. So don't they have nasty thorns? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch, Shane. I just, you know, I think the way people answer questions like that, the other fun one that everybody likes to answer, which is a newer one, was if you had a superpower, what would it be and why? And I think, again, I think that tells you a little bit about someone, I mean, none of us are, you know, therapists here, but I think it tells you a little bit about um, someone's personality to what their answer to that question is. And if our, yeah. I think for me, it's, can they have fun? You know, are they loose enough enough? Can they have a good time? I mean, on, on top of having skills and making sure that they're part of the team, you wanna make sure that they're gonna be able to kind of go with the flow and have a good time. And I, you know, so we've, we've started to institute some of those things, but it, we definitely have a long way to go. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. That's good, thank you. Is there anything else, anybody? Yeah, Kendall, I have a question. Yeah. Um, coming from a background in the medical field, do you notice that some of these questions are different, um, directed to different types of companies? You may have touched on it in the beginning, but I, I hopped on later. Oh, um, 
No, not necessarily. Uh, the actually, I, I stole a lot of this presentation from a um, a really cool PDF that I will send to Carrie to send out to everybody that was had nothing to do with healthcare. It was about um, I think like well, sort of health. It was like child development type stuff, but. Um, I don't know, like when I when I was doing research for the presentation, it, it, it seemed to me like it could be applicable across the board. Um, okay, that yeah. makes sense. And just coming from, like I said, a medical background, just maybe to tweak the questions slightly to kind of direct towards medical or if they're just like you said, across the board, pretty general. Well, you know, I, I, this is the other thing I didn't say. So we have like a set of questions for each interview that we ask, um, that we ask everybody, everybody that's interviewing for any position. And then we have a couple discipline specific. So, you know, um, if you're an RN, you know, we always sort of, uh, but again, it's less about our philosophy here, I guess, is sort of like, we could teach you hospice, if you're a nurse or an, if you're an LPN or an RN or an LMSW, you come with a professional license and we have an understanding that you are sort of understand those skills. Okay. We're looking for people that we can teach um, hospice, end of life, uh, holistic care, right? We're not just caring for a patient's physical symptoms. We're caring for their emotional, spiritual symptoms. And we technically, when we step in, we care for their entire family unit which is not the way that healthcare is delivered in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we really actually in our, um, in our interviews for clinical positions, don't ask a ton of clinical questions, which probably again, like catches people off guard. Um, mm -hmm. We're in a small community. People with, uh, with professional license generally come with sort of a reputation that we could suss out at some point. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We can do, you know, all of the background checks that we do sort of suss out whether you've done something incriminating that would be bad for your license. Okay. Uh, does am I making sense? Like we don't yeah. have, we really, it probably does shock people now that you ask the question. Like we don't ask a ton. Um, you know, like we don't ask any nurses that apply, like, tell us about a time that a patient was in extreme pain and short of breath and what you did to reduce their pain. That makes sense. It does make sense. I mean, if you already know that they have a professional license and it would kind of be double the work to ask them those same questions that they already have the license for. So that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. And again, um, it's death and dying and it's important and it's serious. And um, there are people that come to us really complicated, mm -hmm. but in general, I think I would have a different answer too if we if I was like we were like a surgery you know like a surgical unit or you know like I'm like yeah I don't care if they've never sliced someone before come on in but you know at hospice we're really not um you know it's pretty rare for us to even do a blood draw so basically it's like do you understand how to deliver comfort meds and do you understand some of the um you know other um you know, like the things that come with it, like constipation and nausea and anxiety. But most of the people that we're interviewing for the clinical positions are coming from a nursing home or home health or a place where they're already oriented to that type of stuff. Okay, that makes sense. I think it depends on the office too, because, you know, I learned this from Carrie that you know, we have we found value in a second interview only because our office deals so much with projects that our second interview is solely a project based interview where I've already emailed them a potential project and I want to know, you know, when they come in the second time, how would they have gone through that project. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really good. Really good. I know I'm not gonna Kim uh, Lorraine. I'm on her board and she was just telling us yesterday at exec committee that she has some new um, some new applicants that are needing to submit writing samples. So again, I think that those things are really, um, we don't do that, but it's great insight because it's also like, um, there's a lot of pressure in interviews. And if you are a person that really wants to perform well and really wants to make sure that your best self comes across, you might struggle, but you can really shine if you have some type of like take home project that you can, you know, work on outside of like the pressure of a bunch of people staring at you and judging your reaction about your answer. Cool. Well, 
10 minute break before the next. Uh... Yeah, everyone can take a quick break. Thank you so much, Kendall. I, as, again, you did a fantastic job. I, Thank you're, you. You're two for two. So hopefully you'll, you'll continue to, to provide feedback. You know, your organization does a lot of great work and you're an amazing leader. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, give everybody a few minute break. Um, coming up next is uh, a session led by Kim Lorraine, one of our, our presenting sponsor. It's about prevention. It's everyone's business. That's at 1030. Um, once again, you'll use the general session link that we used just before, and it's also on your list. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, Kendall, and, and everybody have a great, great Mr. morning. <laughs>